Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Katherine Klein and I'm a technical advisor at New York Center for Partnerships and Innovation. Um, in this capacity, I support the coal modernization and carbon management partnership between the U.S. Department of Energy and NARUC. I'll pass things off to Commissioner Mary Throne, who will be moderating today's webinar. She is a co-vice chair of the Committee on Energy Resources and the Environment at NARUC, and she's from the great state of Wyoming, Wyoming where the Wyoming Innovation Center is located. Commissioner Throne, please take it away. Um, thank you, Catherine. And uh, not only am I from Wyoming, I'm from the county where the Innovation Center is located, my native county, as I like to say. Uh, thank you for joining the NARUC Subcommittee on Clean Coal and Carbon Management for today's webinar. R&D Spotlight, the Wyoming Innovation Center and new market opportunities for coal resources. Uh, through the US Department of Energy, Nehru Coal Modernization and Carbon Management Partnership, Nehru promotes learning and discussion among public service commissions on the capabilities of carbon capture, uh, storage and utilization, CCUS, and other advanced pollution control technology, excuse me, technologies to reduce emissions and improve efficiency of coal-fired power plants and other forms of fossil power generation. I'm pleased to welcome everyone to today's presentation. Today, our panel uh, features Dr. Holly Kretka. She's executive director of the University of Wyoming School of Energy Resources. Uh, Dr. Kretka has uh, been at SER for a, a few years now. Uh, she came to Wyoming after serving most recently as the Vice President for Coal Generation and Emissions Technologies at Peabody. Uh, she's been involved in a number of uh, carbon utilization research efforts, including um, serving as a judge for the Carbon, carbon Removal X Prize. Uh, she holds a bachelor's and a PhD, uh, both in chemical engineering. Our second presenter will be Cindy Edwards. Cindy is the area director for the EDA Denver Regional Office, where she oversees programmatic activities for Denver's 10 state region and manages a staff of economic development specialists. Uh, she's been with EDA for 14 years and is also uh, has work experience in state and local government. And then our final presenter will be Dr. Christina Lopano. She is a research physical scientist in NETL's Research and Innovation Center. Uh, she's a min mineralogist by training and uses advanced geochemical characterization to inform environmental stewardship and resource management across the DOE mission space. Uh, and she has a doctorate from um, Penn State Department of Geosciences and her bachelor's degree in geological sciences is from Virginia Tech. Uh, she's been with NETL since 2009. And just this week, she was awarded a Professional Excellence Award from the Association for Women Geoscientists. Uh, so we have a great panel today. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Holly for her presentation. Thank you, Commissioner Throne, and I'd like to thank Nehruk for putting this together. So good morning, everyone. I'm Holly Kreka, Executive Director of the School of Energy Resources. And before we get to um, the slides specific to our unit here at the School of Energy Resources and what we're working on, I was um, tasked with giving a little bit of background on the Wyoming Innovation Center. And so I'm really grateful for the opportunity to do that on behalf of our, our partners from Campbell County, Wyoming, and um, the CEO of that group, um, which is led by Energy Capital Economic Development is Phil Christofferson and just wonderful partners to work with them. So next slide, please. And I'll go through a little bit about the Wyoming Innovation uh, Center. So I'll also talk about our, our mission and pillars here at the School of Energy Resources and how we use centers of excellence to carry out um, research programs here. And then I'll talk specifically about our carbon engineering program and how it ties into the Wyoming Innovation Center and why we're working on these, these coal to products technologies. So next slide, please. 
Okay, so just a little bit about the Innovation Center. It is in Campbell County, Wyoming. You can see that this is a picture of the center and it's focused on advanced carbon technologies. And generally the concept behind it, which is what we're going to discuss on this, this webinar today, is using coal as a source of carbon for manufacturing and really um, supporting these um, communities where there's a lot of coal production. And it's really the bedrock, pun intended, of the economy and um, looking at what, what other opportunities are out there. So next slide. But it's not only about um, the carbon and the coal or really just coal and um, things that can be that the Wyoming Innovation Center is planning on hosting. And the idea behind the Innovation Center is to have it serve to um, as a testing location to help um, novel technologies move out of the lab and into the field and grow in scale. And so the idea is to, to support innovators on their journey toward commercialization. And these innovators could be looking at anything like rare earth elements, critical minerals, things like activated carbon, carbon fire gra graphene, asphalt, agricultural char, and, and much, much more. So those are just a few examples. And I'll talk specifically later about what we're doing here at the School of Energy Resources. Next slide, please. And of course, for the Innovation Center, like anyone, they have partners. So we're, of course, a partner in, in this project and really proud to be so. Um, Campbell County, the City of Gillette, and the Governor's Office have all provided support here in Wyoming. Um, and then there are the local contractors, architects, and subcontractors who have really made this facility a reality. Next slide. So the facility, the Wyoming Innovation Center was completed in March of 2022 and there has been a ribbon cutting and it is now open for business. And next slide. And this is just a, a picture of the facility at night, but you can see in the background, this, it's not only the Wyoming Innovation Center that's in this area. So in that background, you can see the conveyor belt and the silo attached to an activated carbon pr production facility in Campbell County. And also in the area are some other projects like um, the School of Energy Resources with our par partners at Basin Electric um, Power Cooperative are also leading the Carbon Safe Project. So what we have in Campbell County is really a hub for carbon research and it's been termed Carbon Valley. And so we're about we're um, stakeholders working together to find a future um, through innovation for this community and for our natural resources in the state of Wyoming. So next slide. And this is just a plot showing um, the aerial what is available at the Wyoming Innovation Center. So there's seven different different pads available for innovators who are coming to test their te technologies. And those are the larger pads. In addition to that, there's indoor um, laboratory facilities as available, um, conference rooms, meeting rooms, all, kind of, all kinds of opportunities available on site. So next slide. So now I'll talk, so that's a really quick overview of what's available for the Wyoming Innovation Center. And so now I'm going to move to our research projects over here at the School of Energy Resources, why we do what we do and how we um, are developing novel technologies that will eventually be great candidates to be tested um, at the Innovation Center. So next slide, please. So our mission here at the School of Energy Resources is energy-driven economic development for Wyoming. Um, Wyoming has these massive and really unique coal reserves in Campbell County, and they truly are prolific. The, the seams are very thick. They're low ash, low sulfur. And so even as um, there's been a decline in consumption for the power sector, we do believe that continuing to explore this natural resource as an opportunity to um, continue to support our, our state and our communities is really something we should that we need to focus on. So it's something, it's a, it's a natural resource we have. And so um, as part of our mission, we're exploring every opportunity to continue using it. Next slide. And the pillars here at SCR, um, most folks know us, if you're familiar with the School of Energy Resources, for our, our research program. Um, and we are, we're housed at the wonderful University of Wyoming, the only four-year research institution in the state of Wyoming. And we are a land-grant institution. And we, we collaborate, collaborate across campus and very multidisciplinary projects um, to, to drive towards our mission. 
Um, and we, so we support early stage cutting edge research across the university that's focused on energy, but we also are focused on um, how to actually bring those technologies to commercialization. And that's, that's why partners like the Wyoming Innovation Center and the Wyoming Integrated Test Center are so important to us because we need places to test these technologies once they're ready to move out of the lab. We also have extensive outreach across the state, make sure that we're um, engaging with our stakeholders and explaining the technologies that we're developing and um, also having a role in that, that regulatory and policy research uh, area. And we train students for careers in the Wyoming energy or regional in energy industry. So very excited about that. And next slide. So to talk about a little bit about our research portfolio, uh, keep going, please. So the way we divide our research portfolio is into centers of excellence. And so we have several centers of excellence here. This is actually, this is um, not a complete picture of everything we're engaged with at the university, but it does capture a lot of it. So our Center for Economic Geology Research is shown in yellow. And by the way, all the centers shown in yellow are run by research staff that focus on these programs full time. Um, and then the, the centers shown in brown are led by faculty at the University of Wyoming, and both models work great. Um, sometimes it just depends on the level of the technology readiness level is probably a higher TRL would be um, research project would be led by a staff member, whereas a more early stage might be led by a faculty member, but honestly, that's not even always the case. Um, so really, it has to do with where expertise lies at the University of Wyoming. So the Center for Economic Geology Research is, is one of our two flagship centers and um, focused really on anything in the subsurface, so oil and gas production, carbon capture use, or really carbon storage, rare earth elements, critical minerals, economic geology, you name it, underground, this group works on it. Um, the center I'm going to talk about today is the Center for Carbon Capture and Conversion, really focused on those novel technologies to support Wyoming coal sector. So next slide. And so just a little bit about um, CCUS or carbon capture use and storage can't really talk about SCR without talking about this topic. Um, but uh, it's a good example of how we're really focused on um, driving technology toward commercialization. And so the Wyoming Carbon Safe Project is a very large example of that. It's an, our current phase three project is a nearly a $20 million project funded by the Department of Energy and our, our partners like Basin Electric. Um, and we actually, we have two wells, the first two wells in Wyoming completed to class six standards as a part of this project. So um, we're working on, um, on some subsurface testing now, but um, eventually those will be um, converted to class six permits and then they should be ready for commercial scale CO2 injection. So really excited about that project. And of course, as you can see on the list of things we're doing here, we're really working on everything from the techni technical side to the policy and regulatory side. And today, because of all the work that's been done on CCUS over the years, now we're working with commercial partners across the state to develop commercial projects. So super, super exciting time in the CCUS world. Um, go to the next slide. And we, we're definitely looking to do the same thing with coal to products. So um, this is a schematic of our thermochemical process technology, which we call the coal refinery. Basically, our program in carbon engineering is focused on large scale uses of Wyoming coal. So our main products we're focused on are soil fertility products, building materials, and asphalt materials. But we also look at um, products that are, are made at smaller scales. Um, next slide. And the goal here is to use every part of the coal. So um, you can see this schematic um, shows, or this slide shows um, how, where in our current program, um, in our current technology, where each component of the coal will go. So that carbon is really going towards a coal char, and that can be used for things like um, soil amendments, where we're trying to develop amendments for agricultural use that can retain water and fertilizer and soil. Um, also, we're looking at char bricks and many other products. And you can see where um, our coal extract has um, is, a, is being used in a large program focused on asphalts. Um, and so each product we make in this program um, is, is targeting using every piece of the coal and also 
um, we're focused on commercialization and really beating out incumbents in the marketplace. And so that's that's a huge challenge, but that's our that's our challenge here at the University of Wyoming and in, in the Center for Carbon Capture and Conversion. So next slide. And so where we are today is we have actually broken ground um, just adjacent. You can see the Wyoming Innovation Center in the background for our coal refinery demonstration. So that'll be producing raw materials that then we plan to take over to the Wyoming Innovation Center and do um, lab work and um, and try to convert those raw materials into useful products made from Wyoming coal. Um, on the on the pictures on the bottom um, right hand side of the screen, you can see the picture on the bottom left is um, of a coal char brick demo demonstration house. And so that's just one of the many things that that we have built to date. So um, or or made um, using these um, char or different materials from coal. And this is the char bricks and that that little that demo house is on campus and we're collecting data. And so far we found it to be more insulative versus the clay brick counterpart. So we'll keep working on that. And we're really excited about it. And if you're ever in Laramie, Wyoming, uh, it's at 19th and Harney and we'd love to give you a tour. So um, we're also working on soil amendments that are increasingly large in scale. And so um, we're, we're in our second round of greenhouse experiments using corn. Um, we're working on asphalt materials. So we're working on coal drive asphalt binders. Um, and then we have increased research lately on activity with regards to polymers and resins. And we're also working on things like novel ways to transport coal and we'll be releasing that study soon and increasing engagement with industry. So next slide. And so that's all I have. So that's a, a really high level overview of everything we're working on and just really grateful for the partnership with Wyoming Innovation Center. These, these opportunities do matter in Wyoming and for our communities and um, the, the scale of coal production here is large, but and therefore so is the challenge, but we do feel like having partners like the Wyoming Innovation Center is really gonna help us to meet that challenge and support these, these communities. So thank you for your time. Um, thank you, Dr. Kretka. And next um, we will go to uh, Cindy Edwards, um, but I neglected to mention um, that if you have any questions, please put them in the um, question and answer link and uh, we'll do all the questions at the end. So thank you and Cindy, take it away. Okay, thank you. Hi everyone, um, hope you can hear me okay. Yes, are you hearing me? I just wanna check before yes. I- We can hear you Cindy. Thanks. Okay, great, okay, great. Well, um, gosh, Holly, I learned a lot from your presentation of what is um, happening with an innovation center and a lot more about our project. Um, I just wanted to kind of give a perspective of EDA and our role in these type of efforts. Um, not everyone is super familiar with the work um, that EDA does, and so hopefully um, some of the folks on the webinar may be um, having ideas or um, projects in their um, areas that may fit well with what we may be able to fund. So um, can we go to the first slide? So EDA is a, um, an agency within the Department of Commerce. Our mission is to lead the federal economic development agenda by promoting competitiveness, preparing Americans for growth and success in the worldwide economy. Um, as mentioned, um, I am a part of the Denver Regional Office. We cover a 10 state region um, of EDA six regional offices across the US. Next slide. So in order for projects to be considered for EDA funding, um, it, the project would need to align with at least one of our investment priorities. Um, actually, the more that they align with, the competitive the projects would be. And um, these can change over time. They change with administrations and they change the needs of the, the communities and with um, the economy. But right now our current investment priorities are equity. Um, recovery and resilience, workforce development, 
manufacturing, technology-based economic development, environmentally sustainable development, and exports and foreign direct investment. And I think from um, what you can um, imagine, the Wyoming Innovation Center really fits well with all of these investment priorities. Next slide. As far as um, entities that are eligible for our funding, generally um, we fund nonprofit organizations, um, local, state, um, governmental entities, Indian tribes. Um, we also fund a network of development districts across the United States. EDA provides planning dollars for communities to develop a comprehensive economic development strategy. Um, in the Denver region, we fund over 100 of the EDDs and tribes in our um, region. These are a huge network for us. Um, we, we like to think of them as our boots on the ground. They're really familiar with what's going on in the communities, the needs of the communities, and um, can really help us um, reach a wide area for a pretty small agency. Next slide. <clears throat> Um, this slide represents a, uh, a little bit of the work we've done, particularly in the state of Wyoming. Um, as you can see in the past um, 10 or so years, EDA has invested in approximately 46 projects across the state, um, totaling nearly $34 million. Um, typically, our regular program funding, we call our um, EDAP funding, we provide funding in technical assistance, in short-term planning efforts, we have a public works program, um, and e economic adjustment assistance, and then assistance to coal communities, which I'll talk a little bit more about um, later. We also have received significant supplemental appropriations throughout the past years, um, disaster relief, and most recently the, the CARES Act and also the ARPA Act, where we had opportunities in statewide planning, travel and tourism, um, economic adjustment in Indigenous communities. Next slide. <clears throat> so uh, about the Wyoming Innovation Center, um, it was awarded in 2019. Um, EDA provided $1.46 million to the Campbell County Economic Development Corporation. The project um, was matched with $1.46 million in state and local investment. Um, the funding was requested um, to support this facility to serve as an advanced carbon products innovation center um, to advance coal related technologies to move from lab to market. Um, for EA, we really look and are interested in the jobs that the program will be created and also the private investment and for the Wyoming Innovation Center, it's estimated <clears throat> that this project will create 40 jobs and catalyze over $15 million in private investment. And next slide. We also are involved in um, several other efforts that we think um, really support a, a ecosystem around recovery, resiliency, um, and strategic planning in this area. Um, we invested um, at the Northern Wyoming Community College District for equipment. Um, this is equipment to train high skill, high demand in um, late, latest technology. We funded infrastructure um, most recently in Campbell County, um, the port roadway and water service to facilitate a new industrial park. Um, we've also recently invested in the Gillette College Foundation to establish an Office of Transformation. Um, this will help coordinate strategic and implementation of economic development strategies. Um, and again, STEM equipment for the Gillette College. I think the key thing here is just the, the flexibility and the variety that EDA is able to fund. Um, and so we, we do a lot of non-construction, we do construction programs, we can help fund technical assistance and planning. Next slide. A little bit about our assistance to coal communities program. Um, EDA awards funds. This is a competitive grant program. Um, and this is 
um, provided funding to impact specifically those communities that are transitioning or by um, um, coal impacts in their community. Um, typically, these can be construction, they can be non-construction, they can be equipment projects. Generally, the amount of our funding can range from $500,000 to $3 million. Um, that's not a, a set limit, but that's kind of our general funding categories. And this program does require matching funds um, in the amount of 20 to 50 percent. We start at 50 percent, but um, our funding can go higher on the region and the community needs. Next slide. I just um, just wanted to restate EDA's commitment to coal communities. Um, recently, 10% of our $3 billion ARPA funding, which is um, historic level funding, 10% um, of that 30 million went directly, or 300 billion, I'm sorry, was used directly to support um, efforts in coal impacted communities. Um, and so in order to receive um, access to this funding, entities needed to demonstrate eligibility um, and show the impacts of the coal economy in their community or region. And we'll go to the next slide. And then finally, I just I wanted to highlight um, another effort that EDA participates in within the state of Wyoming. It's the Interagency Working Group on Coal. Um, this is a, a forum that promotes job creating investments in communities impacted by power plant closures. Um, it really provides an opportunity for communities and agencies to coordinate their efforts um, to just get together, look at cases, case studies, and um, really be involved in how we might be able to support each other and work together. There are several federal partners, and um, you know, we, I've listed them here, Department of Energy, EPA, EPA USDA, DOI. Um, and it also includes Wyoming state and local agencies. Um, so there's um, good dynamic that happens at these interagency groups, um, things like aligning match and coordinating a project so um, we can help where we can to not duplicate efforts and also um, combine efforts where we can. So next slide. Um, here is, if you'd like information, here's a link to our website. It's just eda.gov. And finally, on our last slide, uh, oh, whoa, I just got hit in the head <laughs> with the thing. Um, that was weird. Um, our economic development representative for the state of Wyoming is Erin Pratt. Erin um, would typically be doing this presentation, but was not available today. So I just wanted to provide his information. So thank you. Um, sorry for that disruption there. And I will close with that. Thank you. Well, thank you, Cindy. And because we were staring at your slides, we didn't notice the disruption. At least I didn't. Uh, but uh, now we'll go on to our final speaker, uh, Dr. Christina Lopano. So take it away, Christina. All right. Thank you so much uh, for having me here today. As uh, you introduced me earlier, I'm a, I'm a research geochemist. Um, with the National Energy Technology Lab. I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We're one of DOE's 17 uh, national labs. Um, we're one of the three that are applied national labs. Um, we are under the umbrella of the fossil energy and carbon management um, with, with the Department of Energy. Um, so I'm gonna discuss some specifics about a project that I have where we've been evaluating rare earth element recovery from Powder River Basin derived coal byproducts. So we're looking to extract resources from waste materials like fly ash that are generated from uh, coal combustion. Um, the blow up here on this slide is a section of the periodic table that highlights the, the lanthanide series or the rare earth elements that are the focus of the initial work. These are known as rare earth elements, not necessarily because they're extremely rare in the earth's crust, but because they are difficult to extract and to mine, um, which is part of why uh, we have an increased focus in, in getting these materials um, in the US. So next slide. 
So why are we concerned about so-called uh, critical minerals and rare earth elements? Um, the U.S. has a huge challenge right now in our dependence to foreign entities for, for critical minerals. Um, I say critical minerals because you can see uh, here in the periodic table beyond the rare earth elements, there are upwards of 50 critical elements that have been identified as being integral for the development of materials that are needed for national defense, uh, advanced optics, technologies, um, and they are absolutely vital for the development of green energy technologies, uh, wind turbines, magnets, uh, particularly the battery technologies for storing energy um, for electric cars and, and things like that. So um, the problem here is we have such a strong foreign dependence on these critical minerals. We are, you know, upwards import dependent on over 80% of the rare earths, um, up to upwards of about 40 to 50% on the uh, remaining critical minerals. And there are some of these critical elements that are 100% sourced um, from uh, other uh, from other countries. So um, obviously you can see uh, that there, there's uh, interest in having a domestic supply of these materials, especially as we move towards uh, uh, green energy technologies. You can read more about this, that this is a report put out by the Department of the Interior and you can read more about it from the link uh, below. Um, next slide. All right. So. What we've been doing here, I'll go back to the previous slide, sorry, is looking at whether we can uh, get value out of fossil energy waste streams. Um, sorry, I must have accidentally had a timer on that one. Um, and these include things like the carbon ore itself, the coal ash, um, the coal reject material or refuse. And if you're back east here in Appalachia, you may be more familiar with acid mine drainage. This is not an issue that you typically see out in, in Wyoming. Um, these uh, materials could potentially be processed to, uh, to rare earth elements um, to fortify the nation's security and feedstocks for advanced materials um, that are necessary for green energy and producing clean water. So next slide. Okay. So, um, you know, coal ash legacy impounds can actually be on the order of, um, and I need to look up this exactly, but it's upwards of 1.5 trillion tons of legacy uh, coal ash impounds throughout the United States. Um, and this is because upwards of 60% of, of ash um, derived from uh, coal combustion is then disposed of as waste. And this is on the order of millions of tons a year. And so there are a lot of different types of coal ash and the morphology and the chemistry of these ashes can depend on the geology of the coal and also the power plant processes. Um, for example, I'm showing two blowups here of some microscope analyses of different uh, fly ash materials. The first with the Appalachian coal ash has uh, generally has higher levels of, of rare earth elements than the Powder River Basin ash, but because of how it's bound and the glass matrix as compared from the Appalachian to the Powder River Basin, it's actually much easier to, to um, extract the rare earth elements out of the Powder River Basin. It's a much uh, less chemically strenuous uh, process and the, therefore cheaper. Um, so next slide. So this coupled with the fact that the Powder River Basin coal is the largest coal source in the country. I mean, Campbell County, Wyoming supplies upwards of about 60% of U.S. energy um, with uh, uh, coal that is, uh, as you can see from the schematic here, that is distributed throughout the country. Um, this is why we wanted to develop a way to access the critical uh, minerals uh, that we could out of these waste materials. So next slide. But in doing so, these are not your traditional ores. So to utilize these lower concentration materials for critical mineral recovery, we need to be smart about it. So first uh, we determine how they're bound um, and then we design strategic and selective means for extracting what we want or need with minimal energy and impact. And this is the focus of the work in my lab group at the NETL. We performed uh, geochemical extractions and characterization, uh, a lot of which may include uh, synchrotron 
uh, characterization at various DOE um, light sources throughout the country. Um, and then we use that information to develop targeted extractions. And in the case here of the patents I have listed here, this is a step leaching protocol that we've developed um, where for, the, for calcium rich ash, which is largely uh, related to Powder River Basin ash, where we only have to dissolve what we need to get out uh, what we want. So we don't have to completely extract the ash as a whole. Um, which means the process is less strenuous and is um, ultimately uh, could be could be cheaper than traditional ore processing. Um, so go ahead, let's go to the left side. So based on what we've learned with uh, my group's characterization work, we are able to develop a method uh, for sequentially leaching rare earths in a targeted fashion. Uh, and because only a fraction of the material is dissolved, the unwanted materials or elements are not uh, dissolved into the ongoing uh, leachate solution that's then processed for a rare earth uh, oxide. And in general, uh, this process is the first step is a, almost like a wash. Uh, we pull out calcium, which can then muck up uh, the system downstream when you're trying to process it more. Second step targets uh, rare earth elements. And we have a third step there, point C on that titration curve there, where we can then extract additional critical metals, um, things like scandium and perhaps uh, cobalt. So we have a patent pending for the targeted uh, sequential leaching. Um, this, uh, this is for a waste product, you know, a, a coal resource uh, that doesn't need to be mined. Um, it's, uh, you know, basically it's thrown away. Um, there's minimal, minimum to no pretreatment. The fly ash is very fine. We don't need to grind it or anything at this point. Um, the method we've developed is done at ambient conditions. So that's at standard uh, temperature and pressure. It doesn't have to be, we're not using vats of the super hot acid, um, which is, is how it sometimes needs to be done with some of the traditional rare earth ores because the materials are so hard to dissolve. Um, and so by optimizing the leaching, we can then reduce solvent consumption and cost later in the processing steps. Um, and we were presenting some of these uh, results at a conference when some of our colleagues at the Wyoming School of Energy Resources approached us. And that's where we first learned about the Wyoming Innovation Center and, and some of the interest um, of everyone out in Wyoming for this for this research, because we were one of the only groups who were doing research related to the Powder River Basin coal ash. And go to the next slide. So in fact, we are um, recently awarded a DOE Technology Commercialization Fund. Uh, this is in order to test these extractions at a larger scale and to build a very small pilot test in, in Wyoming. Um, with our, uh, our eager and supportive partners out of the University of Wyoming School of Energy Resources, Campbell County, and the city of Gillette. Um, and so the Technology Commercialization Fund is an initiative uh, throughout the Department of Energy to increase the technologies, um, the ability of the technologies that are developed in our nation's national labs um, towards commercial development down the road. Often this is termed the valley of death because so many times we are in the lab working with our beakers and, and doing experiments. And you know, we don't always, it doesn't always translate to um, uh, commercial, commercial success. And so this is a program that's designed to do that. So we, we uh, wrote a proposal and applied for it with uh, our Wyoming partners. 50% uh, of the cost share is between DOE and the partners. So DOE uh, is footing uh, half, of, uh, half of this and uh, uh, the partners in Wyoming are footing the other half of this project. Um, and it's a three-year project. We started in December of 2020. Um, so I'll go ahead, next slide. Um, the up upscaling pilot is going to be housed in the recently completed Wyoming Innovation Center. We have begun the process flow diagrams, uh, which is in the lower right corner. Um, and we are working on purchasing equipment and materials to be housed in one, uh, one or perhaps even two of the work areas highlighted in the floor plan of the Wyoming Innovation Center up here on the right. 
Um, we hope to have our equipment in place in summer 2023 to allow for initial pilot tests in the fall of 2023 as we wrap up this project. So we've been able to keep it in time in timeline um, during a pandemic, which has had its challenges, but um, we think there are a lot of exciting opportunities uh, for this um, out, out in Wyoming, which is kind of the, um, you know, as, as Holly mentioned, the, the Carbon Valley uh, out there in Gillette. Um, and we see we've actually started, we've taken it from a beaker and we've started doing some initial lab testing at a barrel scale. And this is roughly going to be the scale of what we're gonna have at this small pilot. Next slide. And so I just wanna take a moment, thank you uh, all for having me here today. And I'm happy to discuss any details of the project. You can reach me at the contact information below. And I'd like to thank the NETL research team who have been developing the laboratory conditions needed for these extractions and also our techno-economic analysis and chemical engineers who are helping us to uh, upscale this project. Um, so with that, I'll wrap up. Um, and pass it back to our moderators. Oh, hey, Mary, you're on mute. Sorry. I clicked on it and it didn't open. Um, so we've had a number of questions pop up in the chat. Uh, uh, but I'm gonna actually go a little off script, not too far off script, not to make people nervous. Um, and before I get to those questions, um, I wanted to start with a question um, for Ms. Edwards, because we're focusing on, you know, how this can help communities. Um, but Cindy, how would a community that is interested in seeking an EDA grant get started? And, and what makes a grant competitive uh, for EDA funding? Um, so yeah, I, I think, you know, from what you've seen, our, our perspective is, is funding that basic infrastructure to support the great work that the other folks talked about how gone in these facilities and so um you know I, I think if if there is a you know potential projects or opportunities for that type of infrastructure we, we don't get you know research that's being done and, and types of things like that so it's important that we kind of understand the outcomes for these type of projects that you know what how is this going to create jobs how is this going to promote private investment so if there's projects out there and an entity or a community is interested in looking to um, for that capital funding to provide that infrastructure, um, one of the best ways to get started is to contact our economic development representatives. And so these are folks out in the field. Um, Aaron Pratt, as I mentioned, is our contact for Wyoming. Um, they can sit down with you and really help applications or just give, you know, advice of this would be a competitive application it would it wouldn't so that's the first place to start also to read and stay on top of the different programs because as i said our, our funding does change um as far as competitive projects um what we talked about with meeting the investment priorities again a, a big focus of the current administration is equity so as we can meet projects that are, you know, providing that equity across communities. Um, and um, just projects that have a lot of partners and, and actually the Wyoming Innovation Center is a great project of showing that competitiveness. I mean, it's obvious all the partners that are involved, how it fits into so many other things that are happening. And so, um, yeah, I think it's, 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 you know, worth reaching out to the EDR. You can look on our website. The EDRs are listed for each of across the U.S. Um, and I would start there. So thanks. Um, thank you, Christina. I'm sorry, Cindy. <laughs> I did have coffee today. <laughs> so we've we've had um, Holly answered a, a question. Um, in the in the ch chat, but 
I think I'll bring it out so you can share your answer with the, the group, Holly. Um, so the question was, as you're developing the carbon conversion technology, are you developing life cycle plan that integrates carbon production, conversion, and end user production? And could you just go ahead and share your answer with the group? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Commissioner Throne. So um, <clears throat> we we are we incorporate life cycle analysis into everything we do. Um, simply if for no other reason because um, the financeability of these different technologies could depend on the life cycle. So um, one of the things I wasn't 100% sure exactly what that question was asking. So I, I do, I wanna make it clear the the most of the work I talked about today mm -hmm. and for our carbon engineering program is related to coal to products, but we also do CO2 to products. And that um, <clears throat> is technology, um, not ours, but other other technology developers have, have tested that at the, Wyoming Innovation Center, which is right down the road, or I'm sorry, the Wyoming Integrated Test Center, which is right down the road from the Innovation Center. So it really is a hub for this kind of work. But um, I think it's really critical. So one of our key technologies related to that will make sure that we have um, an acceptable life cycle analysis of our coal to products work is that we have to either capture the CO2 and store it. And we are, I talked about the Wyoming Carbon Safe Project. We are doing CO2 storage at a large scale um testing in wyoming and then or we can use the co2 and of course wyoming has a very large enhanced oil recovery industry it's the largest use of co2 but we also look at things like dry methane reforming and so um, using methane and co2 and then making syngas which is a building block of basically any petrochemical so that was a really long-winded answer but the the simple answer is yes we're looking at it and we're developing a, a suite of technologies to make sure we're addressing um, any emissions during any of these products. And we totally understand that they need to stand on their own life cycle analysis um, com competitive and be competitive against um, incumbent products in the marketplace. Um, thank you. It looks like we had a number of the questions in the Q&A for um, Christina, uh, but I'm gonna just pull out one or two of them. Yeah, um, you're just typing away at, at some of them. So go ahead and pull the ones you want to. Um, so I think that um, seems like sort of a technical question to me, but I'll, I'm going to go ahead and ask it. Uh, so the question is, I'm most familiar with the term ounce per ton silver gold float. Um, it's sort of a metric. Would there be a comparable metric regarding REs? from the various coal basins? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. We actually have some people here at, at NETL who have been doing uh, research uh, into this um, and have identified uh, the, um, I guess the ore grade of different coal ashes um, throughout the country. And so this is something that there are some publications on. I don't know if it's exactly in the same terms of, uh, of ounce per ton. And then there's, you know, is it a metric ton? Is it this kind of ton? Um, but there, there are some report out there that have, have looked at this. In general, the Appalachian fly ashes um, generally have on the order of, you know, about five to 600 PPM rare earths. Um, and that's per, per million. Um, whereas the uh, Petter River Basin ash tends to be a little bit uh, lower, around uh, two to two three three uh, hundred fifty ppm of of rare earths, um, if that helps. And so, there's been a lot of research, probably in, in the last you know five to eight years, in, in looking at different uh, coal ash. Uh, reserves. And so I could uh, point you towards um, some uh, papers that do discuss this or reports out of DOE that do um, look at this. So I'd be happy to do that um, uh, offline uh, or I guess, you know, follow up with the with the panel um, with some of those. And Commissioner Throne, could I just weigh in on that as well? So sure. um, I think um, Christina hit the nail on the head. We are thinking part, we are talk, we talk about this more as parts per million. And so there's the fly ash project that NETL is leading that we're so grateful to be collaborating 
with Christina and her team on. Um, in addition to that, we're looking at rare earths in coal itself. And so um, it's not that different from fly ash, maybe a little bit higher, but for the whole spectrum, we're seeing, yeah, maybe some um, from the Powder River Basin on the lower side, maybe that are 300 parts per million, but some of them go quite a bit higher. And so we're really trying to nail down, you know, where to find the highest concentration. So it's exciting. Right, there, there might be certain parts of the coal seam that actually mm -hmm. are much more elevated. And so if we can target those and use those coals, um, in combustion, uh, the, the combustion process then turns it into a concentration, if you will, in the fly ash. And so there could be some studies uh, where those are targeted. And that actually almost applies to one of the other, uh, another question that came in um, a little further down too, is looking at different uh, coal bodies uh, for mineral and carbon uh, recovery. Um, um, yeah, if you wanna go ahead and... <laughs> Okay, sure. Um, Take it away. So I think that we answered a little bit, uh, Michael's uh, second question about the uh, rare earth uh, content in, in the ashes. Um, and we can follow up with more reports and details on that too. Um, and then uh, it was a question here from Ben Stewart. It says, uh, evaluated solution mining, small and large coal bodies for mineral and carbon recovery. And that's a really, uh, a really interesting um a really interesting project. And we actually have some research where we've been looking at that and Holly kind of um, alluded to it. We've been working with the University uh, of Wyoming to identify different portions of the Powder River Basin coal seam. Like why, uh, why is, um, you know, the rare earth more extractable? And I think it's because of just the way the rare earths are initially found in the coal. Um, they're not, they seem to be more of a uh, absorbed uh, species as opposed to the um, really recalcitrant um, like monazites, which are like, like the rare earth phosphate. These are things like in the Appalachian coal that actually survive the combustion process and are just tiny grains of monazite that get encapsulated, surrounded by this very robust aluminum and silica glass. Whereas in the Powder River Basin, um, the rare earths um, from our characterization research has shown that the rare earths tend to be uh, diffusely dispersed in the calcium rich glass. And so calcium rich glass as a whole is more um, dissolvable than, than the aluminum and silica really hardy uh, glass. And so, um, Anyway, so that goes back to evaluating the geology. And I think that there are some areas where we could look at, in, uh, I believe you're, Ben, you're referring to potentially in situ um, recovery, uh, I think is, is what you're saying with the solution mining. And I think that there's a lot of really interesting prospects there. And we do have some projects that have started looking at that and the, on a low scale. And I think there's a lot of opportunities there. So Holly, did you wanna did you wanna add to that too? No, I think that okay, I am a chemical engineer, so you did really good geology there. <laughs> and so no, yeah, I think that that sounds great. But um I think the key is exactly the big takeaway is that um the the concentrations of rare earths in fly ash and coal are significantly lower than you would get from like a conventional ore. And we do have conventional um, rare earth element uh, production opportunities here in the state of Wyoming um, and, and actually not too far from Campbell County. However, we there's reason to think that the extraction of the rare earths from these ashes and coal is going to be easier and um, use less um, strong acids and so there may be a real advantage environmentally and, and even financially for for these um, novel approaches to rare earth element recovery so I, that's the chemical engineering side of the story so can i ask a a, a history major non-technical question being generally familiar with the geography of the powder river basin um it seems a little bit like a needle in a haystack kind of thing to find the the rare earths in this massive deposit. It's, is it a little more precise than that? I think there's some general rules and Christina is the real expert, so I'll tear up to give you like a detailed answer, but um, they're definitely concentrated in the overburden and underburden 
So, which is the parts that we're probably not going to sell as conventional coal for conventional coal uses anyway. Okay. Right. Yeah. That's a that's a very good point, point. and I think that uh, it should be pointed out that these um, these coal miners they are they can be extremely precise, and so they have we can you know do characterization and study the the geology of the coal and the surrounding layers, and we can really fine tune and find where consistently these are. Uh, rare earths are. And so a lot of this started about eight years ago when the DOE uh, asked us to start looking at uh, fly ash as a resource. And part of that was trying to understand why um, why the fly ashes were concentrated in these uh, in these materials. Um, and so uh, and it does it goes back to to that geology. And so I think that you know, part of the advantage that the Powder River Basin coal seam is so enormous. Um, I mean, I don't think I really had a grasp on it until I was out there like a couple of weeks ago and I got to see it actually being mined. It, it's just enormous. And, and you know, these operators are just, you know, amazing with the, with the way they can extract certain parts of it. And they do, they, they already do kind of take out certain parts to preferentially uh, use. And so it's if we can identify which parts are actually the parts where the rare earths are coming through, we can make it all, uh, make our jobs all a little bit more easy. Um, Christina, I am going to ask you to look at the last question in the Q&A and see if you've answered it already. But in the, in the meantime, I'm gonna ask Holly a question. Um, because I think this is just sort of a, a big global question. Uh, so given the scale of Wyoming coal production, what we have now, will coal to products make much of an impact in the end for a coal community like Gillette? Great question and ones we're always thinking about, Commissioner Throne. So um, I think the answer is yes, it makes a difference. If you're looking at coal to products or rare earth element and extraction to replace the amount of coal used um, for from combustion to create power, that it's not the same scale. However, it is still very large in scale. So the, the products we're targeting, we're, we're targeting a first commercial scale plant that would be in the on the order of five to ten million tons a year. And so that that for Wyoming scale, where we've been higher than 400 million tons a year, no, it's pretty small, but it creates jobs, it creates high value jobs that fit well with our economy, and it, and it provides revenue that is really critical, and it really can help um, a mine survive, and, and, it, and in, you know, it's not, we're not doing this in a vacuum, like I said, we're already, we're also working on things like CCUS and a range of other um, technologies. And so as part of the overall portfolio, I think it's really important. It does create high quality jobs and revenue for these communities that are that are facing um, decreased coal consumption. So we do think it's absolutely part of the solution. Great. And Mary, I went down, uh, is the last question um, again from Ben Stewart, uh, an example using mineral or CO2 conversion materials to manufacture, yes. is that one? I'm not entirely sure that I, I understand the question. I might have an extra slide. That, um, I'm wondering, uh, because an example, here we go. There we go, the REE supply chain. I don't know if this helps. This is actually uh, uh, my colleague, Tom Tarka is on the line. So he, um, this is actually one of his slides from a presentation he recently gave in, in Alaska. Um, and so there's a white paper um, where the Department of Energy's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy provides an overview of the domestic supply chain for critical minerals and rare earths um, and the DOE efforts to address the challenges associated with the critical minerals. Um, this, uh, this diagram here, this red diagram kind of shows um, where we have issues with the supply chain. And this is a specific uh, example for magnets. And so these magnets are really important in things, uh, in things like wind turbines. 
Um, and so as you can see that um, basically the whole thing is in red. So we have a big problem even with mining. Um, we don't traditionally, we're starting to, to build it back up, but most of the rare earth mining is done at, out of China. Um, but they also have the stranglehold on the midstream processing, the separation and processing, and, and then in turn, the downstream manufacturing of the different magnets. Um, and I'm not sure if that quite answers, uh, answers his question. Let's see. The, so that gives it, it there's a, these rare earths go into manufacturing all sorts of materials that are needed for things ranging from CO2 conversion. Um, there may be some ca catalyst materials that need some of these uh, specific uh, uh, critical uh, minerals and we don't have a way to access them here um, or produce them here in, in the United States um, up to specialized aerospace materials. Um, as well. So I don't know that this really answered the question, but I didn't completely understand it. So well, I think um, I think the slide was helpful. And um, we'll we'll add that to the materials. We are at one minute after the hour. So I would like to thank uh, thank all of you for the work that you're doing in this field. Thank you to the EDA for providing foundational funding for all of these efforts and for the valuable work being done um, at NETL and the School of Energy Resources. Um, the NARUP DOE Coal Modernization and Carbon Management Partnership is planning an upcoming visit to NETL uh, in Morgantown and Pittsburgh this December. There will be details to follow. Uh, and if you're interested, uh, watch for that. Uh, Registration is now open for NARUT's annual meeting in New Orleans. Uh, there's a great program planned, and I'd encourage you to consider that. And always check NARUT's website for upcoming events. And uh, with thank yous again to everybody for participating and um, pulling this all together, uh, I think we can sign off.